Evening, everybody. I'm humming. It's lovely to see you. Uh, being the first Sunday in the month, uh, we're meeting around the Lord's table uh, tonight. If you're uncomfortable with um, using the bread and wine, there's still the little um, COVID uh, cap capsules. And if you prefer to... <laughs> what did I say? Sorry, you can use these. Okay, don't feel under pressure. I mean, I'm being serious. Okay, um, Latitude meeting tonight upstairs for uh, their final study in the Book of Ruth. Monday night, gentlemen, offer spurs at um, half seven upstairs in the balcony room. Tuesday morning, Nathan Natter at half ten. Tuesday night, we're in Zechariah chapters 12 and 13, uh, meeting for Bible study and prayer. Then on Wednesday morning at half ten, Bethany Men is your Christmas event. Tea and coffee to begin with, a time of praise, readings, and an epilogue from Richard. And then lunch, uh, and it's five pounds donation to Norman. Okay, that's Norman's fund. Um, so please, if you're free, men, half ten on Tuesday. Uh, Bethany Tots at ten o'clock on Thursday, and next Sunday at eleven and half six. I think there's a couple of these left. Um, little devotional books from Langham, a partnership. Please lift them, they're free, uh, with some calendars from Langham as well. Please remember to sign up for carol singing next Sunday night. We, we have 20 names that we can go and carol sing to, uh, members and, and friends from Bethany who can't come out to church anymore. Um, so we need more carol singers to join the YF latitude. So please sign up um, about an hour, quarter to eight, quarter to nine, and then back here for supper. So please, if you're healthy and you can sing, well, you don't need to be able to sing, but if you're healthy, uh, please join YF and come in. And it's lovely to knock a door and see somebody like Rose Shilliday or, you know, people that we've forgotten about, um, just to see people from the church uh, singing carols. That'd be lovely. And please remember to sign up for um, the, the drop-in for teenagers on a Tuesday afternoon at half three, and then the new children's ministry on a Friday night called Ex Explore. Okay, reminds me, memory's not good tonight. And I hope you're in singing voice because the pastor's chosen a difficult first hymn, but he's assured me he's going to sing it out. So I'm praying. Right, Richard? I would have I would have sung it out anyway without the welcome everybody good to see you um, <clears throat> nice to uh, be together tonight uh, tonight and next Sunday we are uh, looking at Jesus from two different angles uh, two truths about Jesus one that he is fully God and the other that he is fully man I'm going to take them in that order so tonight uh, Jesus is fully God, uh, and this is what Christmas is all about, isn't it? God become man. Uh, that's an astonishing thing to stand and say. It's a truth that's all through our Christmas carols, and we're going to start with uh, an absolutely ancient one. We've all had about 1,600 years to get to know this carol, so we don't have an awful lot of excuse. Uh, well, there are a few versions of it right enough, but uh, it goes right back to the time when the Nicene Creed was being written, when the deity of Jesus, that he is fully God, was being uh, discussed and affirmed by the church councils. Uh, more, on, uh, more on that some other time. But uh, why don't we stand, and at least one of us will sing uh, God, of God, the, uh, God of God the Uncreated. Uh, let's, let's sing. <clears throat>
it. Uh, <clears throat> great uh, choice of Carol for our theme tonight, and uh, you did a good job indulging me with it. Uh, let's, um, let's pray. Why don't we pray? Christ be praised with God the Father and the Holy Spirit praised evermore and evermore. Lord God, our, our Father, we praise you tonight, our God of love, love before the world began. We praise you for Christ, the source of all creation and the ending, the, the goal, the purpose of it, master of the eternal plan, uh, God's salvation through the Savior, the world's Redeemer. Thank you, Father, that we see all of your love for us when we think of Jesus, when we read of him uh, loving people that no one else would love, when we read of him loving us even though we are sinful, when we read of him dying for us to carry our sins away to the death they deserve so that we can share the new life he gives, a life of love, a life with you, a life forever. We praise him tonight uh, with Father and Spirit, uh, one God. Uh, thank you for, uh, for those among us, Father, who are uh, serving Jesus in different ways among us and, and others known to us. We want to pray tonight for three young churches added to uh, our association of Baptist churches in the last little while in Keedy and Belturbet and Passage West. Uh, we pray for them as those churches grow and as they seek to make you known uh, in their communities, perhaps especially over this Christmas time. Uh, we pray for James from the church in Keedy, recently uh, the new appointed uh, coordinator of, of the Amazing Journey, uh, the ministry of, of Baptist youth that seeks to go into schools. And we thank you that, that even since starting that role, he reckons he's been able to present uh, the, the story of the Bible and the message of the gospel to over 6,000 uh, school children. We thank you and we praise you for that work. And we pray for James and for churches partnering with him. We do pray as well, uh, Father, for, uh, for uh, those among our association who will uh, seek to guide the appointment of a, a new principal for the college and a new youth director for Baptist Youth as, as Edwin Yurt retires and Matthew Campbell uh, moves on. We pray for all of the preparations ongoing uh, for those handovers and uh, the preparations in Baptist Youth even at this time of year for by teams for next summer, uh, looking for leaders, looking for uh, in time, looking for recruits as well to come and join those teams uh, to serve churches around this island. We do want to pray uh, beyond Ireland as well and, and pray uh, tonight for Alex and Mary and thank you for the connections that they have been able to make in the church uh, there in Frankfurt and in the city. We, uh, we, uh, we thank you that Mary's been meeting with a neighbor and Alex with some local pastors. We pray for uh, the new church uh, children's ministry uh, with which they both serve, and for a carol service coming up around the same time as our own uh, in a couple of weeks' time. And we pray for, for Mary finishing uh, an autumn's practical semester in school with uh, much travel back and forth, and for Alex as well, preaching, uh, preaching twice a month uh, coming January, uh, beginning a series on the attributes of our God. And we pray, uh, Father, that you will bless them both as they seek to serve you and to, uh, to minister to the people there in the church uh, in Frankfurt. We pray for ourselves as well that you would help us to make the most of this Christmas season, sharing something of your love uh, in practical ways and uh, through the, the good news of Jesus. We pray for the carol singing uh, coming up, that it would be a blessing to those we're able to visit. We pray for uh, the carol service as well, that your uh, grace uh, uh, through the Lord Jesus would be clearly uh, sung and proclaimed. We pray uh, for our Christmas Day service, that we'd have lots of visitors, that we'd have uh, happy reunions, uh, and pray uh, that for, for these and other chances to make you known, to demonstrate your care, and to point uh, to Jesus. And would you uh, bless us and equip us for all of that, even tonight as we consider him, uh, and we ask in his name and for his glory. Amen. Well, our consecutive readings uh, have uh, taken us as far as John chapter 8 and verse 47. We've been uh, reading, John, uh, reading John for longer than I've been here. <laughs> uh, so John, John chapter 8, and we're going to read uh, from verse 47. It's just the tail end of last week's reading, uh, down to verse 59, the end of the chapter. And uh, 
Well, we don't uh, we don't always plan these things, but um, what a great what a great reading for tonight as we think about Jesus, fully God. Think about his testimony about himself. Let's read John uh, chapter eight as he continues this back and forth with the Pharisees who uh, resolutely disbelieve in him. So, verse forty-seven, John chapter eight, verse forty-seven. Uh, Jesus speaking. Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory, There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died, and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. But you have not known Him. I know Him. If I were to say that I do not know Him, I would be a liar like you, but I do know Him, and I keep His word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Before Abraham was, I am. Jesus clearly taking up the personal name of God from Exodus 3, claiming to be God from God. Uh, Not lost on those listening either, was it? They they took up stones to try to put him to death. Uh, Well, we we rejoice uh, in who he is, and we're going to sing again, Come, let us worship. Come, let us adore. Jesus, Messiah, our Savior is born. Why don't we stand again, and we'll sing.
Well, that's, that's great singing, and uh, for anyone who's really pining for a traditional old carol, we'll hang in there. Uh, there's one coming up uh, later in the service. We're turning to, uh, to John chapter 1. If you've still got John, which uh, I slightly doubt, but if you've still got it, it's just back a few pages, but John chapter 1. Uh, I'm just going to read, uh, read the first five verses, and before we do that, we're going to pray. Um, Let's pray. Father, uh, would you please uh, speak to us now from your written word? Would you teach us of your living word, our Lord Jesus? Would you give us a glimpse of his eternity, his fullness, his deity at this time of year when we remember God become man? And we pray in his name. Amen. Uh, So John chapter 1, reading verses 1 to 5. And this is how John begins. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. Uh, this is God's Word. Uh, tonight we're thinking, as I said, about Jesus fully God. Jesus fully God. I thought we might start with a quiz. Uh, I, re- I really did just say that. We're going to start with a quiz. Um, I'm going to give you a line. This is going to go so badly because no one's going to say anything. Uh, I'm going to give you a lyric from a Christmas carol, and someone is going to have mercy on me standing here and shout out, even a wrong answer would, would, would move us along, wouldn't it? Uh, these are all lyrics about Jesus being fully God. Oh, come, I'm not singing them either. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Somebody. Oh, a little town of Bethlehem, prize for Jack at the back. Uh, very good, very good. Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, maybe that's a slightly subtle reference uh, to Jesus, fully God. Here's a, here's a more obvious one. He came down to earth from heaven who is God and Lord of all. Is it, is, are all these answers coming from the, oh, the same corner? It's not the same person. Uh, yes, once in royal David City. Once in royal David City. Here's one uh, less well-known but I mean, well, anyway, we'll tell you why in a minute. You should get it. Lo, within a manger lies he who built the starry skies. Okay, good. Well, I mean, you sang it this morning if you were here, so, uh, so well done for that. Or, or very God begotten, not created. Someone from the... Just pause this segment here, right? So is anyone... Oh, come, let us adore him. Yes, oh, come, all ye faithful. Uh, begotten, not created. Uh, that's a phrase like, uh, like our opening carol, which uh, goes back about 1,600 years at least, back to the, the time of the writing of the Nicene Creed in answer to this very issue. Jesus, fully God or not? Uh, but why are, we, why are we thinking about this? If you're a Christian, you're probably sitting tonight thinking, well, you know, I appreciate the quiz, but I don't know if I understand uh, that Jesus is fully God and fully man, but I, look, I believe it, so is that not enough? Uh, are, we, are we answering a question that no one is asking? Um, that's, <clears throat> that's where we're going to start, asking why does it really matter? Uh, and from there we'll ask, how do we know? And then to finish Uh, What does it mean? So Jesus is fully God. Uh, Why does it matter? Uh, How do we know? And what does it even mean? So why don't we think, first of all, about that question, why does it matter? Why does it matter that Jesus is fully God? Uh, Well, you might wonder, but this has been one of the uh, most challenging issues in church history. So let me give you a tour. Uh, So in the second century, the, the Ebionites thought Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, but they rejected the idea of his divinity and his virgin birth. Uh, because they uh, rejected Jesus as fully God, they continued to insist that uh, Christians needed to, to basically be Jewish, follow the Jewish uh, laws and rituals. And if you read the New Testament, you know there's no excuse 
uh, for that. But they were followed in the third and fourth centuries by the, uh, by the Arians, they who denied that Jesus was fully God uh, and taught instead that he was the first and best of God's creatures, the one through whom the rest of the creation was created. Now, like according to a pretty reputable survey that I saw about this, about three quarters of American evangelicals, it was an American survey, about three quarters of American evangelical Christians uh, re reckoned that was correct. They agreed with that, uh, that Jesus is the, the, the first and best of God's creatures through whom the rest of creation was, was created. And I reckon that was the most shocking part of, of the survey. I don't know what Christmas carols they're singing, uh, none of the ones that we're, that we're singing, but um, that was a shocker. Uh, from around the same time, Eutychianism, apparently, I, just write that down, it's going to be on the test. Uh, Eutychianism uh, said that Christ's natures were so thoroughly scrambled together that Christ was neither truly God nor truly man. So they thought we're going to get, away, get ourselves out of this question. We're going to duck out and just say, well, he's kind of neither truly God nor truly man. Um, from the 5th to the 13th centuries, there's this idea floating around called Nestorianism, where God is kind of, uh, Jesus is two distinct persons. There's, there's the God part and the human part, and they're kind of overlapping and doing some stuff, and that's that's sort of floating around for a long time. So it's been a big question in church history, but it's not just a question for, you know, yesteryear. Even today, many an atheist will argue that Jesus of Nazareth, if he even existed, was simply an influential teacher, nothing more. Uh, so fully human, in other words. Uh, Muslims will say that he was a great prophet, but nothing more. And the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, even the Christadelphians, if you ever come across them, they would all agree that they do not think that Jesus was fully God, although they do not agree on what they think he was. Uh, but uh, these wrong beliefs, in other words, are, are held and ideas are taught in the UK and Ireland uh, even today in 2022. And it's not just a question for yesteryear. And it does, it does matter. It doesn't really matter to us what the Nestorians believed. You can't even remember which one of those last few people the Nestorians were, and neither can I. I would have to turn back and, uh, and, and, and have a look. But it doesn't really matter, perhaps, to us what they believed, but, but it absolutely matters what the answer is to this question. Uh, at stake in this question, is Jesus fully God? At stake in this question is nothing less than the gospel itself. You see, if Jesus is not fully God, then God has not come to us, and we do not know him. If Jesus is not fully God, then we have to question a lot of what his apostles taught, because they certainly taught that. So suddenly, uh, we've got no confidence uh, left in the Bible. If Jesus is not fully God, then his sacrifice is not enough to cover us, uh, not all of us anyway. If Jesus is not fully God, then we are not saved. If Jesus is not fully God, we have no assurance, no peace, no access to God in prayer, no strength from God in temptation, no comfort from God in suffering, because God doesn't have these personal experiences uh, that allow him to empathize with us. Um, and simply, if Jesus is not fully God, we don't know him, we're not right with him, and we have neither our present nor our future with him. C.S. Lewis said that the doctrine of Christ's uh, divinity seems, he said, it seems to me not something stuck on which you can unstick, but something that peeps out at every point so that you'd have to unravel the whole web to get rid of it. Well, don't panic. Uh, Jesus was and is fully God. But uh, before we uh, get into that too much. Let's ask, oops, I shouldn't have changed that yet. Uh, how do we know? Jesus is fully God, but how do we know? In a few minutes, we are turning back to John chapter 1. Before we do that, let me give you a little bit of scaffolding that you could use to talk about Jesus as fully God. Uh, perhaps, you know, if the, if the JWs come calling or something, how do we know Jesus is fully God? Let me give you three, uh, three ways. So one, uh, look at the life of Jesus. Here is a man who had God's power, he stilled the storm, he healed the sick, he raised the dead. He had God's knowledge, he knew people's unspoken thoughts. He taught with authority that no one had ever seen. And he had God's 
immortality. He said in, in John 10, we haven't got there yet, but uh, John 10, I lay down my life and that I may take it up again. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. He has God's immortality. Here was a man who looked towards his coming death and claimed to have power to lay down his life and take it up again, which anyone can say, but on this side of the resurrection, that looks like a powerful claim, doesn't it? So Jesus' power, his authority, his knowledge, his immortality, we can look at the life of Jesus and say, here's someone who really looks like he is fully God. How else can we know? Well, we can look at the language used of Jesus. At least seven times the New Testament calls Jesus Theos, uh, where we get theology. It's God. Theos is God. It calls him God, and we're going to see uh, one of those in John. Many times it calls him Kyrios, Lord. Uh, not always just a title of respect, but sometimes very clearly about God. So we'll come, is it next week in Luke, to, uh, to the angel saying, for Oh, no, it's not next week. But for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. He's a baby who's not only the Christ but the Lord. He is God himself. John the Baptist, we've just been seeing, was preparing the way of the Lord. Quoting Isaiah 40, where God is the one who's coming among his people. Uh, God is coming, and so arrives Jesus, God in the flesh. Uh, not just names, but ideas that in the Old Testament were all about God, in the New Testament are applied to Jesus, the bridegroom for his people, the shepherd of his people, the first and the last, the Messiah, the King of God's kingdom, the Son of Man, the one who comes to judge and to rule. Uh, and Jesus' own claim here in John chapter 8, we, we read it, before Abraham was, I am. I am the, the name of God. Uh, for himself, given to Moses, the eternal existing one. And we saw the reaction to it, didn't we? We saw that the, the, the people listening knew exactly what he meant by that. He said, I am, and they picked up stones to stone him. They knew he was claiming to be God. So we can look at the life of Jesus, look at the language used of Jesus uh, by himself and the apostles, and then, uh, and then thirdly, look at the theology of Jesus. God alone is the creator. God alone is the savior. God alone is the judge. God alone is worthy of worship. But in the New Testament, every one of those things is applied to Jesus. How do we know he's fully God? We look at the life, the language, and the theology of Jesus. And we can see, I think as C.S. Lewis did, that the divinity of Jesus is peeping out at every point. So look, that's a little bit of scaffolding, a bit of an aerial survey. Let's land in John chapter 1, and with the rest of our time, we'll, we'll just ask, what does it mean? What does it mean that Jesus is fully God? There was an article in a newspaper some time ago, and it ran like this. Twenty people are claiming to be Jesus, and the rightful heir to 30,000 pounds left in the will of religious recluse Ernest Digweed, Mr. Digweed passed away in his home in Portsmouth and left his entire estate to Jesus so that he, Jesus, would have some money if the second coming should actually occur. Uh, but uh, until then, Mr. Digweed named the public trustees as executors, and it is they who must decide whether any hopeful claimant is Jesus. Uh, they refuse to reveal the identities of the hopefuls, though one is rumored to be a steel worker from Sheffield. Uh, which is funny till you think Jesus was a carpenter from Nazareth, so probably not a, bad, not a bad claim. Anyway, they also will not say what their criteria are for checking each claim. Uh, an official said, we politely acknowledge all claims. Usually people go away after a while or admit that they cannot support the claim. If, however, there was a claim that appeared to be theologically sound, then it would have to be considered very carefully. I'm sure those, those per uh, trustees... Uh, would rather have, uh, have, have given the money away or done anything but, but have been left with this, this problem uh, from Mr. Digweed. I'm sure they're still waiting. But we do need to know who Jesus is. And John 1 has a few things to say to us. It? It's got some of those criteria for us. So first of all, Jesus, the Word, was with God and was God. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Uh, we know well, don't we, from our recent studies in Genesis, 
that John's opening line reminds us of something a little bit earlier. It reminds us of Genesis 1-1, doesn't it? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, here, in the beginning, was the Word. So whatever the Word is, it's there, existing eternally before creation. The Word was with God, so the Word exists eternally but is distinct from God the Father. The Word is not God the Father. The Word was God, so the Word is fully God along with God the Father. Uh, what we're, we're seeing is one part of what the Bible teaches about the Trinity. One God, three persons, Father, Son, Spirit. Um, when we need to think about one person of the Trinity, we need to try and hold a couple of different ideas together. One is that each person of the Trinity is fully God. And the other fact is that each person of the Trinity is not either of the others. Uh, so, you know, the Father is God, but the Father is not the Son. Uh, the Father did not come and die on the cross. The Son is God. The Son came and died on the cross, but He did not come and live in the believers at Pentecost. That's the Spirit. The Spirit is God, but He did not send the Son into the world. The Father did that. So there's some distinct roles, each fully God, but each not the others. Um, I would love to draw it. Uh, it never works, though, does it, when people try to draw the Trinity? And um, apologies to anyone who might be sitting with a pen right now, sort of trying to come up with something, some sort of sketch, but it never works, does it, uh, when someone tries to draw the Trinity. About the best that I've uh, come across is the idea that you kind of, you draw a green circle that represents God the Father, uh, then tracing exactly the same line, you draw a red circle for the sun, and then over those two circles, you draw another circle, a, whatever color is left, blue circle for the Spirit. Each circle covers exactly the same area, the same space. So each full circle is fully God, covering the same space, but each of the, each of the circles is still distinct. Uh, it would t make a terrible sketch because you're just going to end up with something brown. You're just going to end up with a brown circle. It's not really going to be worth anything, but at least it's not too heretical as far as uh, sketches of the Trinity go. But uh, somehow the persons of the Trinity are each fully God, but also each distinct from one another in person and role. It's a mind bender, a bit, a bit much for 7 p.m. on a Sunday night, isn't it? But, uh, but Jesus, the Word, was with God and was God. Huge claims, huge claims for John to make. Uh, but he's not finished. Next, Jesus, the Word, is the Father's agent of creation. John, uh, John hinted about that by calling Jesus the Word. Uh, if you read past John 1, you'll see John, John doesn't call Jesus the Word again in the rest of his book. He calls him the Son, S-O-N. So why does he call him the Word here? Uh, John knows that to the Greeks who will read his book, the idea of the Word was an idea of reason and principle uh, that gave order to the universe. And to the Jews, the Word is about God's creating power, His strength, His activity. And God said, let there be, and there was. In Genesis 1, it's God's powerful speech uh, that creates all things. And John says the Word, the principle that gives uh, order to the, the universe, the, the power that brings uh, the creation into being, is a person. Uh, and before creation, this person was with God, and this person was God. And verse 3, sure enough, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So through him all things were made. God uh, the Son is the agent of creation. The Father commands creation, and the Son creates creation. Uh, he has ownership and authority over all that he has made. Uh, and without him, nothing was made that has been made. So the Son is not a creature, is He? Nothing was made. Uh, without Him was not anything made that was made. So nothing was made without Him. Then He was not made. He's not the first and best of God's creatures. Three quarters of American evangelicals, if that survey was right, 
uh, need to read this verse at Christmas time and think a little bit about it, don't they? The Son who came into the world is not just the first and finest of the creatures. He is not less than God Himself. Uh, the Son who was born on earth is the eternal Son of the Trinity. Uh, the Son who, who was reared under this guiding star uh, is the Son who placed each star in space to begin with. So Jesus, the Word, was with God and was God. Jesus is the agent of the Father's creation. Uh, and last, Jesus, the Word, is the self-existent source of light and life. Not very catchy headings tonight, are they? But they're all lifted right out of John chapter 1. So verse 4, in him was life, uh, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In him was life. God the Son has life and existence in and of himself. No one brought him into existence. No one gave him life. He is God of God, light of of light, very God, begotten, not created. We'll sing that some, some uh, evening soon, I think. Um, usually a child is begotten uh, by reproduction, uh, so brought into being. Think about the genealogies in some of our older Bibles, our older translations. They, they read like, Abraham, Abraham, Abraham begat, um, Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, uh, but, but in the Trinity, begotten doesn't mean that there was a time when the Father brought the Son into existence. It means that the Father has always been the Father, and the Son has always been the Son. That has always been their relationship. Those have always been their roles. Uh, and two of those early church councils in the 300s gave us the Nicene Creed. Uh, it's a creed from the Council of Nicaea, that's why it's called that. Um, and, and it says, among other things, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Oh, we're going to we're gonna have to teach the Nicene Creed sometime, aren't we? But let's, um, let's stick with tonight. Uh, back in, in chapter 1, verse 4, in him was life, and that life was the light of men, of all mankind. Jesus was light and life in and of himself, and that light and life have come to us. Uh, he gives his life and his light so that we may see and live gives of his light that we may see. He gives of his life that we may live. And so Jesus, uh, the word was with God and was God. He's the father's agent of creation, and he is the self-existent source of light and life. This is the one who, who came for us, who was born in weakness and poverty and scandal, who lived a perfect life on our behalf, who suffered the rejection of his people and the, the abandonment of his friends. This is the one who bled and died under the black sky of God's judgment, his father's judgment, who endured the wrath and the, the separation from the father, the father that he had known from eternity past, the father who had loved the son for all eternity. And this is the one who gives us life from his life, who gives us light from his light, who welcomes us into the heart of his love with the Father and the Spirit. Uh, and only God can save, but fully God, Jesus, can save us from sin. Only God can forgive. It's God who's been wronged, but Jesus is the one who is wronged by our sin, and fully God, Jesus, can forgive our sin. Only God is enough to save. If Jesus had only been one perfect man, he could only have taken the place of one sinner, one for one. But fully God and infinitely valuable, Jesus can pay the price for all of us. Only one who is fully God and fully man can make God known, can be our go-between, and Jesus, fully God, makes God known, and he mediates between us and God. So Jesus uh, fully God. Why does it matter? Uh, actually, it's absolutely vital. We let that go, as many have in, 
in the history of the church, we're going to lose everything. Um, the whole thing unravels if we pull that thread. Jesus, fully God, how do we know? Well, it's the clear teaching of the Bible in the life of Jesus, in the language used of Jesus, and in the theology describing Jesus. And Jesus, fully God, what does it mean? It means that the Savior who came for us is no less than the eternal Son. We have a Savior who can genuinely forgive us. He has that right. We have a Savior for whom no depth of sin and no number of sinners is too much. He can do it. He saves us completely. It means that when we know Jesus, we do know God. Uh, and we have grace from God, and we're being sought by God, and bought by God, and brought by God, and welcomed by God, and adopted by God, and forever loved by God. Um, we want to see Jesus more clearly for who He is. Sometimes that means grappling with some, some tricky questions, doesn't it? We want to fuel our experience this Christmas uh, by realizing just what it is that has happened, just what it is we're singing about when we sing lines like, He came down to earth from heaven, who is God and Lord of all. Or even the, the tricky lines like, very God, begotten, not created. The best response probably is to sing. Uh, so, so let's do that. Let's, let's sing. We'll pray first, but let's, uh, let's pray and then sing. Uh, we'll, we'll praise God together. We're going to sing at least one of these lines that we've considered tonight. But let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we confess uh, that our, our appetite to, to think through difficult and challenging ideas is not always what it might be, uh, and yet how much we can gain from thinking about you and about what you have done. That is a, that is a, a fruitful exercise. That's a rich seam uh, to be mined for us. And as we've thought tonight about Jesus, who was and is fully God, Christ in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, we give you thanks that this is not, not a dry question, not an irrelevant question. It's the glory of our faith. We have a God so committed to us in love that you came among us. In the person of God the Son, you became the God of humility, the God of shame, the God of suffering and death, the God of wounds and scars. Fully God, Jesus is the one person we look to when we want to know you. Fully God, he's the one person we can trust with our lives for all eternity. Fully God, he's the one person we can go to for help to live for you. Fully God, he's the one person everyone needs to know and to worship. So Father, would you enthuse us. Uh, would you even delight us with these things uh, and inspire us and equip us to share them this Christmas? And we ask uh, in the name of God the Son, our Lord Jesus. Amen. Uh, we are going to sing. After this, we'll, we'll share uh, communion. We're going to pass the trays, as was mentioned, from hand to hand. Uh, you, you can feel free to use these and should have confidence to do so if you want to, to, to use those. Um, if, you would like to, uh, if you'd like to be served from the trays and you don't really want to pass the trays along, feel free to kind of spread out into some of the other rows and the deacons will be able to reach you without, uh, without leaning over other people. So, you know, if you want to spread out during this song, uh, feel free to do that. But we're going to sing, He came down to earth from heaven who is God and Lord of all. Why don't we stand? We'll sing this together.
to uh, move over to the table and uh, remember the Lord's death. Well, the book of, uh, of Hebrews speaks of Jesus as fully God and fully man. I'm going to read uh, just two short sections from that book now and uh, really say very little about it. But um, first of all, uh, from, from Hebrews chapter 1, just the first few verses. And then uh, turning a little later in the book after that. But let's, uh, let's read. Um, so, so long ago, says the writer of Hebrews, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And a little bit uh, later on in the book, uh, the writer says this, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need." Because Jesus is fully God and fully man, we have confidence to draw near, to receive mercy and grace uh, from God Himself. Uh, If you're trusting in Jesus for the mercy and the grace that only He can provide, do uh, do share the bread and the wine as they're passed uh, around. If if not, just uh, do use the time to think about these things. Uh, We're going to take a pause now for a moment to pray, each of us. Uh, to, to pray and to consider these things before God. And after, uh, after a short time, we'll ask if someone would perhaps lead us in giving thanks for the bread uh, before we share it together. Let's pray.
Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. And as someone has said, though he was God, yet for our sakes he became man. And Father, we don't understand that any more than we understand what we hearing tonight. But Father, we thank you for sending your Son. We thank you, Father, for sending the best that you had to live amongst us, to live down here as a man amongst men. Father, we thank you for him. We thank you for that life, that sinless, spotless life. It had to be sinless, had to be spotless, had to be holy, or he couldn't be a saviour. We thank you, Father, for all of that. We thank you that he was able, as John said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Father, we thank you for him tonight. We thank you for every remembrance of him. We thank you, Father, as we take this bread, the reminders of that body that was beaten and bruised for us. He didn't deserve it. But, Father, we thank you for your plan that sent your son to die in our place. We give you thanks in his name. Well, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. We'll ask, please, that someone would lead us in giving thanks for the wine which reminds us of the blood of Jesus shed for us. Let's pray.
And Jesus took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. As the trays come past, it's our, our custom to, uh, to take and to drink and to replace the glass uh, before you pass the tray along. Together we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What a thing to proclaim, the death of the eternal Son given for us. We're going to finish the service with uh, an old prayer uh, that I think fits our passage and our theme for tonight. We pray, Almighty God, in the birth of your Son, you have poured out on us the new light of your incarnate Word and shown us the fullness of your love. Help us to walk in this light and dwell in this love that we may know the fullness of his joy who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Amen.